So yeah, thanks again, everyone. So basically, I was going to give morning just to kind of an an overview of my own personal journey with spinal cord injury. I have a spinal cord injury, and then I was going to go over kind of an overview of the work that's been done in Dr. Hanna's lab over these past years. Uh, so, and basically this all kind of leads to why I believe there's going to be better options, treatments for spinal cord injury in the future. So this is my daughter, Josie here. We got chickens at the beginning of the pandemic here and she really loves them. But basically in 2003, we were building a house in Middleton and uh, it was in April, kind of April 5th, so early in the year. There was an ice storm the night before and it was a Saturday morning, so we were just working on the ground, but it got fairly warm and it started melting off the trusses and I had thought it all melted off. So when I went up there, I ended up slipping off. It wasn't all melted off basically. And I shattered C5 and C6 vertebrae. And you know, at that time I was told that they did not think I would regain any function. Uh, Dr. Paul Anderson actually did the, the spinal surgery and I also had a, a fair amount of problems with my lungs on the way down when I was falling. I had hit my ribs and uh, ended up with a collapsed lung and some other problems that went along with it. But I was engaged at the time to be married in uh, in May. Uh, because of the injury, we ended up pushing it off till June 6th. And I actually just got a, a one day pass from the hospital where we were able to leave the hospital for a day. And then I spent the night at the Best Western down the road and came back the next morning before he, because I still had quite a bit of uh, problems with my lungs more or less at that time. But a couple things about this that I wanted to point out. First of all, so my wife, Amy, shown here, she has been just extremely helpful with everything I've done along the way. I'm so lucky to have her uh, helping take care of me and she's just been amazing. But then the other thing I really wanted to mention to this group, because so many of you deal with this all the time, but uh, the amount of care and compassion and professionalism shown by all of the healthcare workers throughout this whole, it was almost three months that I was in the hospital. It was just incredible. I can't thank you all enough for what you do. I think that it's just, it was, it was so impressive to see there were so many people there that really, they were not just there collecting a paycheck. These were people that cared about what they did and really worked hard to do the best they could for the patient. Both my wife and I were just extremely thankful. You can even see in the top left picture here, there's uh, the two nurses actually got me ready in my tux for the wedding that morning. So the nurses and stuff, I mean, from uh, surgeons to the doctors, to the therapists, the nurses are the ones that you work with the most, but just, just a tremendous amount of super caring, helpful people along the way. So after that at the UW hospital there, I ended up going to a Meritor Day Rehab at the time. And this is where they did a, a lot of the traditional therapy to try and get your uh, your life back since so much had changed. And uh, this was extremely influential in me getting a lot of my, my uh, independence back. They were great. It was basically like going to a shop every day where you actually went there for the full day. So, you know, I was went there from morning to night and uh, it was much more at the time the UW only had an outpatient therapy where you'd only do, you know, a few hours a week outpatient. And I, I just don't think that's enough when you talk about spinal cord injury, stroke, and some of these other major injuries. Uh, it's just not enough to do a few, every aspect of your life has changed. Uh, as you know now, the UW does have a great 50 patient uh, on the east side to do the, the rehabilitation. This Meritor Day Rehab has since closed down, but uh, now that the UW has that, it's all good. From there, I went to a place called Project Walk. And this was more of a non-traditional therapy where they worked in more of spasms and trying to get muscle back that actually wasn't currently working. And that was in California. And then I went to a, a place called SCI Step in Ohio. And this they worked a lot with, uh, it was more non-traditional where they were working more with stimulation and different things, trying to get more muscle back. And the reason I went to Ohio is I also did my undergraduate degree at the time at Miami University of Ohio. And then before coming to the UW. And really my point with a lot of that is I gained a lot of friends uh, with spinal cord injury throughout that time. And just thinking about some of that stuff throughout the therapy that I wanted to talk about. The first thing is, you know, muscle management, you know, uh, this is just showing here where they're using some electrical stimulation to build the muscle. And Ohio there, we also had an electrical stimulation bike like this. So this basically, you know, you've got the pads on your legs that are firing synchronized to pedal the bike. And really then they, you know, you're also thinking about pedaling that as you're doing it, trying to regain some of that. And then they're able to turn the tension up 
on that bike to try and pull more muscle up. And then I also use this as a para step, you know, where you've got the pads on your legs basically, and then there's buttons on the walker that you can press to fire different leg muscles and make steps with it. Which it was really a lot of work and good for therapy, but practically it's not it's not near as good as a wheelchair. So kind of my one of my points with this that that muscle without the control in general is just it's detrimental. It it ends up being you know, extremely hard to deal with. Uh, I, I had a friend that was using the Easton bike probably too much and built up too much muscle. And that actually led to where he couldn't, he couldn't transfer himself because if he spasmed, it was so strong, it would just throw him on the floor. You know, also with riding, you know, it would end up being where you can kick the gas pedals or, or throw yourself out of the seat. So it was, if it, there's no control, it's just, is not helpful. A couple other ob observations just in general from therapy. This is kind of me thinking back at that time. So hard work paid off, and I mean, that's just in general life, hard work always pays off. But it really wasn't a good indicator of, of the outcome. I Meaning there was several people there, you know, you'd see them, they were super intense, you know, always early, working extremely hard, and, and really didn't maybe gain back much. And there, there may be some that are, you know, coming there, showing up a little late, don't really seem wholeheartedly into it, and they may gain back more. And then, you know, along with that, you'd also notice that there was small differences in muscle had huge impacts on mobility and the amount of capability of a, of a patient. There was a, a young man there that in California, I'll never forget, he was a C6 injury, so not a whole lot of difference in function than me. But he had triceps, and he could actually kind of scoop back to his chair and get up off the floor into the chair. It was really impressive. If I fall out of the chair, I'm like a turtle on its back. So this is, again, kind of me thinking back at that time, you know, what causes this big difference in final outcome and, and how can it be improved? You know, what is what's going on here exactly? And I like to use these two as a good example of a work ethic comparison. So, I mean, these are true professional athletes. Obviously, they, they know how to train. They're going to work hard. They're injured around the same time. And they both have a cervical injury that's somewhat similar. They both lose complete motor control below the level of injury. A couple things with football injuries, you know, I mean, anytime they're hurt, there's five trainers that run out and stabilize them immediately, uh, which is great. When I actually fell off that uh, roof, I was somewhat dazed, uh, a little confused. And when I was laying there, I had thought lumber had fallen on top of me is why I couldn't get up. I didn't realize what was going on. And I turned my neck completely around to look back at the house. And at that time, I could feel the uh, you know extreme pain in my neck. Along with, you could actually hear the bones grinding. So I didn't do myself any favor there. And then also with this football injury like this, two grown men running into each other, you know, there's a lot of force there, but compared to what a lot of you see in the ER and different things that you see with terms of car crashes, there's much more force and, you know, many other things damaged compared to this. But I think these are a really good example since it's so similar. But Mike Utley, he basically never regained any more function below his level of injury. You can see here he's got large triceps, his thumbs up, that's kind of that C6 area. But Dennis Bird, Actually, you know, you can see here he's, he's he's holding his fingers up like this for C5, so he's got hand function. He's standing. He walked out there. He had substantial recovery. And really, then there was there was a book by Dennis Bird called Rise and Walk, kind of an autobiography. And he uh, he had more sensation below the level of injury. So, uh, you know, he did extremely well, but more than likely, it was just that the accident, the original injury, wasn't quite as bad for Dennis Bird. You know, also thinking about injury level comparison. So this is Brian Reich. He actually was a student at Marquette University uh, in 1998, and he jumped on a slip and slide and must have landed a little awkwardly and, and uh, crushed his C5 spinal cord. But, uh, you know, a couple things with him. First of all, I don't know if, any, if everybody knows this, but he started the Brian Reich Paralysis Foundation, and he's raised several million dollars for research. He's actually given us a couple grants. So he's, a, he's just a great guy, but he's not able to open his hands, as you can see here. His wrists, you can see he's got wrist braces on, and his hands kind of stay clutched up. He's in an electric chair. Whereas this is this is me, so I am able to kind of open my hands more. I have more wrist movement, which allows me to kind of be in a manual chair. There isn't a whole lot of difference in function between us. We both crush the C5 vertebrae, but I end up with, I've got more rotation of my forearms and I've got more wrist movement. 
where he didn't have that. Some of mine actually came back nine months after injury. But with that little bit of wrist movement and rotation, uh, one of the things like I can be in an, a manual chair, which I'm in now. Uh, so I basically propel myself by using the friction on the rim of the chair. And this is actually really helpful when you think about lab settings or office settings. You know, it's, it's just really helpful to, to be able to be in a manual chair. Since I'm able to use a wrist, you know, I'm holding a pencil now and using just the tenodesis to hold that stuff. Whereas without that wrist movement, you've got to have adaptive equipment such as this to hold forks and utensils. I'm able to rotate my forearms and lock my elbows out and then do a shoulder press to transfer. So I'm able to transfer myself. And that leads to where I can drive better. I actually am able to get in the van and then I'm able to just transfer over to a, another seat by doing that shoulder press, obviously leading to more independence. And some of that more independence then leads to less stress on a caregiver, which is usually a loved one. So it can lead to better relationships. So really what I wanted to drive home with this, this whole slide here is that these small amounts of function can really change the quality of life for a patient, just to make huge changes in terms of quality of life even though all we're talking about is some rotation of the forearm and some wrist movement. So I would like to kind of keep that in mind through some of the rest of this, the uh, presentation when we talk about some of the other uh, treatments. But one of the things that's said a lot with spinal cord injury patients is more find a cure for spinal cord injury. And I mean, I wish this was that simple, but uh, I don't think it's really the right way to think about it. I think that it should be thought about more as designing a treatment to try and maximize the amount of function that's either retained or regained after spinal cord injury. And as I was really trying to drive home there is that small amounts of function can make huge changes on the quality of life. And this leads to less stress on caregivers, which is usually a loved one and can lead to better relationships and better mental health. So it really can change things. So that was kind of more on my personal life. So this then kind of from here, I would like to go into just an overview of the work that's been done in Dr. Hanna's lab. And uh, we've had a lot of great students throughout the past few years in the lab. So almost all spinal cord injury, as you most people know here, is that it, it's a crush to the spinal cord and not, not a, a transection, but more of a crush. And this leads to the initial trauma, the, the neuron and glial death, the cell death. And there's also a secondary damage that occurs, which is the migration of several support cells, leading to a larger cyst and a larger glial scar. And then in that glial scar, there's been different things, such as the proteoglycans that they've shown actually inhibit some of the axon regeneration. So kind of with that in mind, I wanted to talk about some of the treatments that we worked on. So this picture here, I'll show kind of throughout, but what they're showing is that they're kind of showing this white circle here as the original zone of damage. Then after all that secondary damage occurs, you end up with a larger cyst and a larger glial scar. So one of the things we worked on was trying to promote more axial, axonal regeneration by reducing some of these inhibitors, such as the proteoglycans, which we'll talk more about. So a lot of the work that we have done in the Mer or in the HAM lab is in collaboration with Bill Murphy's lab, and they do a lot with drug delivery. And we've used these mineral coatings to deliver a lot of different therapeutic molecules, which we'll talk again more throughout. So here we're showing it just an uncoated uh, beta TCP absorbable microparticle. And then we basically coat it with this mineral coating. And the important part is really these calcium and phosphate peaks on this coating. And it's not just that these mineral coatings deliver therapeutic molecules over time. The really novelty and the impressive part about it is that they're able to maintain the biological activity of these proteins. And that's kind of what I want to show here a little bit. So first of all, this is just showing interleukin-13, interleukin-10, and interleukin-4. If we just take these proteins and we incubate them 5,000 picograms per milliliter in a simulated body fluid at physiological conditions, and then we pull them out and we try to read them later with an enzyme-linked amino assay, Basically, we can't hardly even read anything because they've unfolded so bad they're not immunoreactive. They've just unfolded so bad. If we take those same proteins and we bind them to the mineral coating first, and then we incubate them at physiological conditions, we can actually read them with ELISAs for weeks. They're still immunoreactive. So just really showing that it's helping keep them uh, basically folded properly. And I'll show more about bioactivity as we go. It's, it's, it's just really 
been impressive. So the first thing I was going to talk about more is so chondroitin's ABC is a bacterial enzyme that digests the glycosaminoglycan chains off those proteoglycans, and it's been shown to promote more axonal sprouting and promote recovery in these rats. So the problem, though, with chondroitin's ABC, it's a fairly large protein, and it's extremely unstable. So this protein, uh, just at body temperature, is just very unstable. And there was a PhD student in the Murphy lab that came up with uh, with this. His name was Andrew Kahlo. And he basically designed an mRNA construct for chondroitin's ABC that could be delivered with those microparticles. And then it could be basically upregulate the using the cells right there in the injury site to upregulate this chondroitin's ABC and digest those proteoglycans. So to test this, kind of what we did is just showing here we, we did a T10 injury in a rat, basically just a 10 gram weight dropped from 12 and a half millimeter height. And then what we did is we closed them back up. We waited for some of the glial scar to form. And then seven days later, we injected those microparticles carrying that mRNA construct. And this is showing them in terms of the hind them function of the rats is what the BBB score here is. And what you can see is that uh, after six weeks after injection, the MCM plus the uh, mRNA construct, those rats did have significantly more hind them function. And then this is showing after we harvested those spinal cords. So these are sagittal sections of spinal cord. And basically the, the astrocytes labeled here with GFAP and then CS56 is full length proteoglycans. And what you can see is that in the saline injection, we've got you know some of this green CS56 where we really don't have much of that when we have that mRNA construct. And then looking at those uh, same rats, basically if we look at 1B5, which is digested proteoglycans, you can see that we don't have much in the saline injection, but we have more of that digested uh, proteoglycans in the uh, mRNA construct. And that actually was significantly more there. So that's that that paper is actually currently being submitted for uh, publication. Another project that we worked on in thinking about treatments, one would be using scaffolds to try and grow those axons around this cyst or through this cyst. So we used actually a peripheral nerve grafts from a donor rat along with the growth factor to try and promote more axon regeneration. So in this case, we're using the growth factor neurotrophin 3, which has been shown to promote axon sprouting and growth. And really, uh, the, the whole delivery system is the same. It's from the mineral coating that's actually delivering it. In this case, we use an absorbable micro uh, suture that was coated with the mineral coating. And then that bound and released the neurotrophin 3, which you can see here in vitro, we released it a uh, nice sustained release. And then the scaffold for axonal growth was a sciatic nerve from a donor rat. And this sciatic nerve was actually cut on the proximal end seven days before it was in, um, incorporated in the recipient rats. And this allowed for Waller and degeneration, which is segmentation and removal of the damage axons in myelin, along with upregulations of several important cytokines. So this is showing your the surgery Dr. Hanna did so basically at the T10 level, he's removing three millimeters of spinal cord, completely removing it, and then adding in two sciatic nerve grafts along with that, the sutures that are loaded with neurotrophin three. And then we're harvesting those rats eight weeks after incorporation. And this is showing after harvesting them, basically if we try a transverse section right through the center of those grafts, what we see is we've got the neural filament in, uh, in green, and then the cell nuclei DAPI in blue. But you can see we've got a lot of neural filaments, kind of axons that are that are uh, swirling around here in the graft. And we end up with significantly more axons if we include those NT3 loaded sutures. So that's important because it's showing that the NT3 is biologically active in vivo. And then if we also take that and we look at, again, these are the functional scores, the BBB scores. Again, this is a complete transaction, so the scores are lower. With just a sciatic nerve graft alone, we end up with uh, seeing us significantly better than the uh, transsection only group. And also, if we look at the group that's incorporated with the neurotrophin three sutures, they did better than just the transsection only. However, they did not do significantly better than the uh, cytic nerve graft only group. And we believe that that was probably due to axon entrapment. So if we're releasing so much neurotrophin three right on those graphs and in those graphs, 
uh, we're really not giving the axons uh, the level of communication basically to to grow back out of the graft. And this is showing from a different paper where they're looking at sciatic nerve grafts. They use a lentic viral factor. Again, with the growth factor, and they had the same thing where they caused axon entrapments. Uh, they actually showed uh, detrimental and less axons growing out of that graft because it was just all growing in the graft. So some possible improvements to this, you know, with further research. One thing would be maybe the glial scar is built up on the end where that uh, graft is meeting the spinal cord. So maybe we need to incorporate chondroitin's ABC. And then also maybe there needs to be a depot of NT3 further down the spinal cord to help them grow out. Uh, one thing I, I mean, scaffold, sometimes it can be pretty invasive in terms of you've got a club or dura matter open in order to incorporate any type of scaffold. So kind of the last uh, project, you know, and Dr. Hannah mentioned this at the beginning was if we're saying that this, this uh, original zone of damage here was, was smaller, and then we end up with all the secondary damage where we end up with a larger cyst. Can we try and limit this damage that occurs, block some of these cells from dying, block some of this apoptosis? And we actually looked at interleukin-10. I, I just want to point out, to me, when in thinking about this, this to me is, is a lot like stroke with TPA. I mean, the patient still has the stroke. There may, there's still going to be some deficits. It's not a, probably a complete healing, but uh, you're trying to get that oxygen, all that, all that uh, nutrients there so that those cells aren't dying. Try and reduce the amount of damage. And that's really what we're trying to do here. It's just trying to reduce that damage. So in thinking about that, this is a, a good review paper that came out of Kentucky. And what it's showing here is that uh, in normal wound healing, you have these M1 macrophages that are really, they're in the inflammatory macrophages only around for a, a short period of time. And they kind of skew more into an anti-inflammatory phenotype remodeling. Whereas after spinal cord injury, these inflammatory macrophages hang around indefinitely. And you end up with a sustained inflammation, and there really is very little of the, the uh, rebuilding macrophages that are around. And there's apoptosis continuing for weeks after injury. So one of the things we were looking at then at the time was just reading up on, there was papers where they did a systemic injection of interleukin-10, and they showed a reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokine, reduced apoptosis, and an overall promoted more functional recovery. So really our objective then was wondering, you know, hypothesis, if we're able to use our microparticles and uh, keep this uh, interleukin-10 local and in a therapeutic range for a suspended time period, would we be able to enhance the, some of the things with, this, with the systemic injection of interleukin-10? So again, we use the microparticles here. We had a nice release in vitro uh, of the interleukin-10. We did the same spinal cord confusion that I talked about earlier. And in this case, we injected those microparticles immediately after injury. And then we homogenized the spinal cord at different time points uh, to measure cytokine levels and looked at the uh, macrophage phenotype along with the functional tests. So TNF-alpha and interleukin-1-beta are a couple of inflammatory cytokines that were previously looked at with the uh, systemic injection of interleukin 10, that's why we looked at these two. And uh, basically, 24 hours after injury, both the systemic injection of interleukin 10 or the sustained release of interleukin 10 significantly reduce these pro inflammatory cytokines. Whereas uh, at seven days after injury, it was just with the systemic, I mean, sorry, with the uh, sustained release of interleukin 10 that we've seen a reduction in TNF alpha. We didn't see a difference in interleukin 1 beta. Uh, one thing with that is that we would like to do uh, more of a multiplex assay to get more of a broad idea of what's all going on in the inflammation process after spinal cord injury there. Uh, another thing we did here was look at macrophage phenotype. So this is seven days after injury. Uh, and what we see is that we've got significantly less when we have the sustained release of interleukin 10. We have significantly less of these macrophages expressing antigens characteristic of an inflammatory phenotype. And we've got significantly more of uh, the antigens characteristic of an earlier stage anti-inflammatory phenotype. And then this is looking at actually seven weeks after injury. Once those spinal cords are harvested again, this is from sagittal sections looking directly in the injury site. And the tomato lectin here shown in blue, this is labeling all macrophages, which there's a lot there in the injury. 
And then Marco is an antigen more characteristic of an M1 macrophage, whereas CD163 is more characteristic of an anti-inflammatory M2 macrophage. And what we see is when we have the sustained release of interleukin 10, we see less of those M1 characteristics and more of the M2 characteristics, which was a significant difference. So we also looked at lesion size. Again, this is on sagittal sections where we've got the astrocytes labeled there with GFAP. And what we see in terms of the infrac size is that uh, both the systemic IL-10 and the MCMs plus IL-10 uh, significantly reduce that infarct. But in terms of, we also kind of looked at spinal atrophy. So basically, you can see how much thinner the spinal cord is here. Well, that atrophy was less in the sustained IL-10 group. So with uh, a little bit smaller injuries and stuff, you know, the next thing we were wondering is, are we keeping more of these axons intact through the injury site? So we injected an axon tracer into different areas of the motor cortex, red nucleus, and the reticular formation. And we took transverse sections rostral to the injury and transverse sections caudal to the injury and counted the axons that extended through the injury level. So looking at those cortical spinal tracks first, so this is rostral to the injury site. Uh, you can see, so in the rat, the dorsal cortical spinal tract is right at the bottom of those dorsal columns. And we have almost a thousand axons actually labeled in there in red, that you can see. And then the blue there is just dappy. But if we look caudal to that injury site, we actually see, we don't see any axons. And this is regardless of the groups. We don't see uh, any axons extending through in that tract. Uh, in the lateral and ventral, Cortical spinal tracts, we did see axons that extended through, but those, in terms of differences between the groups, there was no difference at all for the cortical spinal tracts. Or when we looked at some of those brainstem axons. So again, this is showing rostral, and you can see we've, in red here, we've got a lot of axons labeled in this transverse section. And if we look caudal to that injury, you can see on the control here, where it's just the injury only, we, we do have axons labeled in here eventually. There, there's not that many, and they're mostly ventral. Whereas if you look at the uh, sustained release of interleukin 10, you can see there's more axons. And those axons, you see them even further dorsal than what you would in the, the control. And that actually turned out to be significantly more axons extending through that injured level of spinal cord. And we did also, then, you know, the next question is, is that improving function? And really with the systemic injection, we did not see a significant improvement in function. Uh, they had in previous papers, and then with just a small local injection of interleukin 10 or just the MCMs alone, we didn't see any difference at all. Whereas with that sustained release of interleukin 10, we did see a significant improvement in the hind limb function of those rats. So kind of from that, then you know this is basically just showing that we did see good results that we would like to investigate further. You know, we'd like to perform some more optimization with this in the rat model. Both in terms of the dosage, we really didn't you know, look at many different doses or release timeframes. And then also, could we inject this? I mentioned we inject it right after injury. Could we inject it at more of a clinically relevant time? And we'd like to also explore some other anti-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-4 and interleukin-13, share a receptor complex, and they've been shown to skew macrophages to an anti-inflammatory phenotype. So we'd like to look at those interleukin-6 blockers. I mean, recently here, it's been, you know, they've been using it with COVID. If there's too much inflammation and too much fluid buildup in the lungs, we're running with by uh, checking on some more things with the inter interleukin-6 blockers. And then we'd like to eventually test this in larger animal models. We're thinking maybe the Wisconsin miniature swine. So with that, I'd you know, like to thank several people here. First of all, the Brian Reese Paralysis Foundation, I mentioned they they actually, you know, funded the Neurotrophin 3 work and the Interleukin 10 work along with the department. So thanks, Dr. Dempsey, for that. Uh, and then also I mentioned that uh, this is all in collaboration a lot with Bill Murphy's lab. Bill Murphy is in the top picture there on the far right. Uh, he's been super helpful. And then Dr. Jason Lee here is uh, on the far left of that top picture. He actually is the one that did all the in vitro work that I was talking about. And then uh, Dr. Andrew Kalil here. He actually did the chondroitin's ABC work that I was discussing. He actually is, is uh, doing his postdoc now between uh, Harvard and MIT. So he's an extremely smart individual. 
And then also thanks to Dr. Hannah down here in the bottom picture, and then the, all the students that we've had, you know, in the lab throughout kind of all this work. So thanks everyone, I guess, and I'll, thanks for listening. I'll take any questions, Jeff. Dan, thanks very, Dan. very much. I mean, this is a very inspiring talk, Dan, and, and in a lot of ways. I'm, I'm very proud that the department supports work like this so that you can submit and get the grants, but I'm really proud of the number of students that this work inspires, and their careers will be changed forever. Uh, it's also a very clear and logical approach to the problem that you've outlined here, which is a big research uh, lesson for our residents and students. So thanks very much. Do we have questions for Dan? Thanks, Dr. Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, please do. <laughs> oh, hi. Thank you so much. That was very inspiring from personal standpoint of view and professional standpoint of view. I'm Gayatri Santi. I'm a neurosurgeon at Swedish American Hospital here. Um, I am very particularly inspired. Um, thank you for sharing all your personal life. I'm particularly inspired with all of this interlinking work and everything else that you have showed me. This is very fascinating and close to my heart. I've done PhD in neuroscience, uh, neuroimmunology, actually, with Matt Romanos interleukin work with other things in another aspect other than spinal cord injury. Uh, I am always thinking whenever I see patients with, uh, this is maybe a simpler question, but I always think, you know, there are a lot of people that come with severe, you know, back pains and uh, nothing to do with their spinal cord injuries per se. I always think about amount of cytokines and inflammatory, inflammatory cytokines that are causing these problems and sometimes, you know, a short course of steroid gives a temporary relief. I'm wondering your thoughts or ideas that you may have in general, how we can look into how much of inflammatory agents like in the disc space or something else contributing and how we can find some answers for this in the future for back end of how much of these cytokines will be acting and causing it. Yeah, I mean that's that's a good question and definitely a a problem I'm sure that a lot of people have for as far as the pain. I mean with some of the interleukins they have shown that it does affect uh you know like I said I'm I'm working more with the spinal cord injury versus some of the uh spine pain that you're talking about. But they have shown you know that that it does affect the neuropathic pain seen in spinal cord injuries, I'm sure just, just like it, you had mentioned that there probably is, you know, different interleukins for as far as those, those pains and some of the cytokines that, uh, that are affecting it. I guess I don't know exactly yeah. what they would be. Um, God, do you have any thoughts on that? Because that's the bridge there that's so important. And also, as opposed to steroids, some of the non-steroidals that where they might have less side effects and still affect that mechanism. Uh, yeah, it, it makes sense theoretically that if you probably inject those microparticles with the anti-inflammatory cytokines, it may reduce the potential for back pain. We just haven't tested it. I guess if you, if you want to do that, we have to do it in a bigger animal with a disc degeneration model. That's worth testing, but we haven't done that. But it is, it is a good thought, and it's a good example of applying lessons learned to the problem that you are working with in the clinic every day. Thank you very much for that question. We have other questions for Dan. Okay. Dan, I want to thank you very much. This is inspiring work and uh, I'm proud of everybody. I want to, we're getting near the end of the year. We will have uh, other conferences, but Start uh, start to begin to wish everybody the best of the holiday season and in the, the end of the year. Thanks, now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Great talk. Yep, thanks a lot, Dr. Anna. Thanks, everyone, and happy holidays.